Welcome horror fans, cinephiles, and friends, one and all. I am your host, the King in Giallo, and I will navigate you through the wonderfully absurd world of Giallo films, or Jolly for plural. In this channel, I will show clips, give reviews and rundowns, and count Giallo film cliches and tropes observed in these individual movies, and then add them all up into a score I call the Gialli Tally. I will cover my Giallo film cliche list in another video, because trust me, there are a lot of cliches, tropes, staples, and signatures all found within this mostly dead genre, and I owe it to them to give a complete and thorough rundown before delving into the tallies. If you want a brief intro into the first set of cliches, you can see my YouTube short for the A to Z Giallo film cliche list in under a minute video. In this video, I will introduce you to the giallo film genre. I imagine if you found this channel on your own, you probably are already familiar with the genre. Regardless, this video should help inform anyone curious to know more about this genre and how it impacted modern cinema. Please be aware that this video will contain out of context clips throughout which may act as spoilers for some films. Also be warned that within these clips are occasional instances of graphic violence. Okay, first thing to know about this film genre is the name. Giallo. It is Italian for yellow. The name comes from I Libri Gialli, the name given to a series of Italian mystery pulp fictions with yellow cover backgrounds. Later, these became known as Il Giallo Mandadori, after longtime editor Arnaldo Mandadori. These mystery crime novels were very popular in the early 20th century before and after World War II, with weekly publications which are still ongoing today. Most popular authors included in these pulp novels are Agatha Christie and Edgar Wallace. Remember his name for later. So this will give you a strong idea of what these were like. Murder mysteries were a hot commodity back in the day. I will also mention here that a major influence, maybe not as obvious, but nonetheless, is Edgar Allan Poe back in the mid-1800s, particularly with his stories The Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Telltale Heart, and The Black Cat. Moving on. Along with these printed pulp novels, another major influence to the genre, particularly the earliest of giallo films, were the films of Alfred Hitchcock, whose extensive filmography ranges from the 1920s to the 1960s before petering out in the 1970s. Movies like The Man Who Knew Too Much, Shadow of a Doubt. Don't start imagining things. How could you do such things? You're my uncle. We thought you were the most wonderful man in the world. Charlie, what do you know? Sit down. Sit down. Vertigo and Psycho. All right, we're getting familiar with what these are all about. A bit of murder, a bit of mystery, conspiracies even. Let's take a quick detour to Germany post-World War II. Beginning in 1959 until about 1972, German movie studio Rialto Film made a slew of criminal flicks, most of which were based on the novels of Edgar Wallace, 39 of his, in fact. These movies were called Krimi, short for the German Kriminalfilm. This genre, more than most other subgenres, would prove to be the main influence on the later styles found commonplace in Giallo. Around the same time as this, in the early 1960s, particularly starting in 1963, Herschel Gordon Lewis released the film Blood Feast, considered the first splatter film. Splatter film was a term coined later by George A. Romero, father of the zombie genre, when he was trying to describe his new movie at the time, Dawn of the Dead. A splatter film, in short, is a type of exploitation film which focuses on replicating scenes of gore and graphic violence, including mutilations by using special effects and lots of fake blood. These films were focused on a, quote, fascination with the vulnerability of the human body and the theatricality of its mutilation. Splatter is the cinematic revival of Grand Guignal Theater, a type of Parisian theater style popular in Pigalle from 1897 to 1962, which itself also centered on a fascination with replicating for the stage scenes of graphic violence, blood, and mutilations, 
The subgenre of splatter cinema came into existence by Herschel Gordon Lewis, trying to fill a niche that was rarely utilized in film at the time. Sure, there were already a handful of violent movies in the 1950s and early 60s, such as the gothic hammer films like The Curse of Frankenstein and Horror of Dracula, and Shintoho horror film Jigoku, depicting the torments of Buddhist hell, but Lewis wanted to up the ante of graphic violence in films at the time, especially for American audiences. Another influence, albeit to a lesser extent, is the crime fiction and mystery genre of film noir. Popular during the 1920s to 50s, with its own classic period through the 40s and 50s, noir utilized intense atmospheric vignettes, which is obviously copied in some giallo films, particularly the older ones. Noir were also wonderfully engaging mystery stories, and as we will learn more of later, no giallo is without a mystery linchpinning it. Finally, in terms of giallo influences, we must cite the sexploitation films popular in the 1960s and 70s, which were obsessed with nudity and non-explicit sex scenes. These were grossly more tame than pornographic films of actual simulated sex, and they helped to incorporate more sexual themes and nudity to be found commonplace in cinema around this time. Let's stop and jump forward to the end for a moment. Don't worry, we will go back. It just really helps to better understand the full story of giallo films within the greater timeline of cinema. Slasher films. For the context of the history of cinema and horror films, gialli were popular and in demand in Italy a solid decade before the slasher genre boom of the 1980s. And sure, we had psychological thrillers like 1960's Psycho and Peeping Tom, and 1968's Twisted Nerve. Martin, I sometimes wonder whether you feel anything for anybody. Except you, Mummy. Here, got any change, mate? And the best of British luck to you, too! But these were still proto-slashers, or early slashers. It's hard to be truly considered a member of and entrenched within a genre and its cliches if you existed over two decades before the genre even established itself. Even popular slashers like 1974's Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Black Christmas are too early to be official slashers. They are proto-slashers, not quite splatter, but definitely trending in a sort of new direction. Regarding the slasher genre, it was really 1978's Halloween which set the craze and mainstreamed a new type of movie, and hot on its heels were 1980's Friday the 13th, which truly cemented the genre. And this was nearly a decade after giallo films had already thrilled audiences in Italy and Europe for years. In fact, the giallo boom began in 1970, and by 1975 the genre was beginning to fizzle out, and finally by 1980, it was overstaying its welcome, but the slasher genre did help reinvigorate it once again, ushering in a return of giallo in 1980s Italy. Now let's take it back a bit to the giallo films of Italy. So, the giallo genre existed after the splatter, crimi, psychological thriller, and sexploitation, and film noir genres, but before the slasher genre. Got it. It has elements of crime and depictions of violence. It has elements of slasher and some jolly R slashers, but that is just an optional mode, really. Slasher implies that the plot of the film revolves around ongoing murders, typically orchestrated by the same individual or a group of individuals working in concert or even copycat killings. Therefore, jello films can be slashers. Most are, and my favorites typically are, but they can also be crime fictions, like Crimi. They can be heavily psychological, like the stories of Poe, or the early psychological thriller films of Hitchcock. They can be detective stories, like film noir. They can be sexploitations. A few even have paranormal flair, again, like Poe. But they really shouldn't. They should be more grounded in reality. In fact, 
A giallo may have elements of the supernatural or paranormal, but at the end of the day, the villain must be human. They should be more grounded in reality. But what is the best way to describe a giallo film? Well, to quote Ernesto Gastaldi's opening words in his section, What is a giallo? in Troy Howard's book, So Deadly, So Perverse, 50 Years of Italian Giallo Films, Volume 1, 1963 to 1973, quote, a giallo is not a detective story, it is not a thriller, not a suspense movie, not a horror film. But it can be any one of these things rolled into one. What sets a giallo apart from another story? Two things. A difficult to explain event and its rigorously logical explanation based on the evidence and details provided in the story. The event is almost always a murder. I want to go off script for a moment and just freestyle based on that definition because for me that actually is the best definition I've encountered for what a giallo film is. Because at the end of the day, they're not all murder mysteries. They're not all whodunits. They're not all detective stories. Most of them are any one of those things they could be. A lot of them have elements of slashers because there are ongoing killings perpetrated by a killer that needs to be investigated. But on top of them being mysteries, because that's a very vague description, but what it really is is there is a mystery at the root of the story. There is a difficult to explain event. And then the whole plot of the movie is the uncovering of this logical explanation that is the reason behind everything. And that's why Jala movies are not paranormal or supernatural, is because at the end of the day, the explanation is grounded in reality. I think that definition is just so perfect for what a giallo film can be because it casts such a wide net. And in the scope of giallo films, if you've seen anywhere near 30 of these movies like I have, you start finding films that fall somewhat out of the norm and they get to a point where you're like, hmm, I don't know how I can classify that as a giallo. For me, the biggest example of that is one of my favorites, which is a very underrated movie and a very hard to find movie, which is Luigi Bazzani's Footprints on the Moon or just Footprints or Le Orme. That story is so fascinating. And the first time I watched it, I was taken aback because I was a little bored. I was not expecting that. I was expecting a typical giallo. But that movie, in my opinion, has one of the greatest endings one of the greatest endings in a giallo. It's certainly one of the coolest endings just in a movie in general, visually, just atmospherically. That is a giallo in a, in, based on that definition. And sure, there, it's, it's not, um, it's not about, it's not a slasher. There is a murder in it, but it's just such a treat of a movie. No matter what qualities a giallo film has, at its heart, it is a mystery, just like the novels. But on that note, not every slasher that's a mystery is a giallo. Scream is not a giallo. Friday the 13th is not a giallo. But that being said, they both do carry a fair amount of the tropes of the genre. But Wes Craven's Scream is a retrospective satire on the slasher genre and its cliches, whereas Friday the 13th is admittedly by its creator Sean Cunningham, a cash-in ripoff of John Carpenter's Halloween, Plus, it is also very obviously copying the middle 40 minutes or so of Mario Bava's 1971 giallo, Bay of Blood, with two kills directly lifted from the movie and placed in Friday the 13th Part 1 and Part 2. There's more to a slasher, but I would classify a slasher as a giallo film with the mystery and nuance stripped away. They keep the murder, splatter, and the sexploitation, and usually strip away the crime and film noir aspects. They may have a mystery element to them, but they have a greater focus on the violence, and they're absolutely horror. Whereas I would not classify Giallo as horror, but rather a stepping stone towards slasher. I'm gonna go off script again here before I get some flack for saying that slashers lack nuance. Sure, there are some that do, but generally speaking, slashers are all kind of rehashings of the same movie. They may just change the dressing a little bit, but. A slasher is kind of a, just a slasher. And then typically the only way you really see a slasher being original is 
when it comes to either the location, the set pieces, or the killer's backstory. Oh, it's a doll. Oh, it's a bunch of puppets. Oh, it's a leprechaun. Oh, it is a little boy who died but didn't actually die, and now he's a zombie of him, his former self. I find it very interesting that Jalo movies are a subgenre of horror, but at the same time, they really are lacking in horror. They, yes, they deal with life and death, which is essentially what the horror genre does deal with, by and large, whether it's scary or not, it typically is dealing with life or death. But Jalos really exist in this very weird in-between of crime, mystery, and horror, but it, again, they're not very scary. Like, for me, that was one of the first things that I discovered, and I'm a huge horror fan and a huge slasher fan, and so when I first watched Jalo movies over 10 years ago, I was kind of taken aback. I was uh, impressed with the style differences, with uh, the different choices you see the Italian directors making. The music is different. Um, I liked trying to figure out who the killers were, but I never was really scared. There are a... I will say there are a fistful, less than a handful, there are a fistful of giallo movies that I have seen that actually had moments that had me scared. I will show one of those moments. So what was the first Jalo? How did this all happen? Well, as we've already discussed, at this point in the 1960s, cinema was no stranger to murder mysteries, or characters with psychological issues, or scenes of graphic violence, or even a fascination with naked and beautiful people getting hot and heavy. But you can always count on Italian cinema of the 20th century to rip off and exploit something popular that had a market to make a quick dollar, all the while putting an Italian spin on the whole thing. This is how we got the ultra-violent Italian westerns of the 1960s with Sergio Leone's Dollars Trilogy featuring Clint Eastwood and Sergio Corbucci's 1966, Django. So for Giallo, it all started with Italian directors initially adapting those yellow-covered pulp novels into films while using new filming techniques to add in layers of psychological thriller to the mix. You add a dash of jazz or progressive rock or early synthetic music and plenty of naked women and sexual themes, and you're already halfway there. Most fans will credit the first true early or proto-Giallo as Mario Bava's 1963 The Girl Who Knew Too Much. Sounds a little familiar. This movie feels very much like a Hitchcock-inspired film, which it is, and it does lend a lot of giallo tropes, but Bava's 1964 film Blood and Black Lace is much closer to what a giallo would become, an androgynous killer in black gloves. The 1960s did have a lot of proto gialli movies filled with that good old s &V, sex and violence, laden with psychological elements like Luigi Bazzani's 1965 film The Possessed. Most of Umberto Lenzi's gialli were made during this pre-giallo era, but it wasn't until 1970 that a young film critic turned director named Dario Argento unleashed a masterpiece. The Bird with the Crystal Plumage, which set the giallo genre apart from everything before it. 
like what Halloween would be for slashers in 1978. Bird with the Crystal Plumage became the official trendsetter of the new giallo genre, and the 1970s became filled with other examples and imitations. Mario Bava's 1970 film, Hatchet for the Honeymoon, added even more violence, upping the ante. And again in 1971 with his Bay of Blood, adding the kind of graphic violence that would become staples in slasher films by 1980 with Friday the 13th. 1972 was the biggest year for Jello films, with well over 30 films coming out that year. In 1975, Dario Argento came out with Deep Red, which is hugely regarded as the most quintessential and perfect Jello film. And with that, the genre was starting to slow down. By 1976, there were only about three films. And then with Dario Argento's 1977 supernatural horror masterpiece, Suspiria, the genre seemed to have been put down for the count. Italian directors shifted the types of movies they were making. Giallo films weren't as popular with audiences, nor were they as cheap to make as previously, and in the 1980s, there were only about 40 Giallo films in total, with one of my personal favorites in 1982, Lucio Fulci's The New York Ripper. The 1990s had around 15 films total. The 2000s had less than 10. And as of 2023, in the decades since, they've been less than 10, and most of those are homage films. Dario Argento has continued to make giallo films with his most recent in late 2022, but I don't think he's made a decent giallo for over 20 years personally. My opinion being Sleepless was the last one that I actually enjoyed. I'm a bad boy! <laughs> Looking back, the giallo film genre had a heyday of about five years to a decade but its influence spawned the slasher genre, a genre that, similarly to its principal villains, just refuses to die. Some of the most notable films influenced by the genre directly include the penultimate film of Hitchcock, Frenzy, in 1972, numerous films of Brian De Palma, 1976's Alice, Sweet Alice, David Fincher's 1995, Seven, Edgar Wright's 2021, Last Night in Soho, and James Wan's 2022 film, Malignant. Well, that's the history of Giallo in context of its influences down to what it influenced. But let's say you're watching a movie and aren't sure if it's a Giallo. How can you tell? Firstly, I think it's very unlikely anybody would be watching a Giallo film and not know they are watching one. I'd say 99 times out of 100, these films are watched by people familiar with the genre, and therefore they're seeking out individual films, or they're just watching any Giallo that is readily available. The genre is it's just so niche, and most films don't stand up on their own outside of being part of the genre. And this is coming from a long-time dedicated fan of Giallo. Maybe... Deep Red, The New York Ripper, and Torso are all movies I could see a slasher fan watching and not really realizing that they're a separate subgenre. But hell, let's say you're on Shudder and are watching a random old flick. Okay, the typical giallo has a fashionably dressed androgynous killer, or two, stalking around in black gloves, maybe a trench coat, a hat, and sunglasses, wielding a knife or a straight razor usually, and killing off their victims for a mysterious reason ranging from greed and financial gain, or obsessive revenge or trauma, or blackmail, or fulfilling their own dark and sexual perversions. Whereas our hero investigating the murders is typically an amateur sleuth who may have witnessed one of the murders and is now the prime suspect, and so they're motivated by the need to clear their own name with the authorities, or perhaps they are being blackmailed or stalked by the killer, or they are obsessively determined to catch the killer in order to avenge someone dear to them who was killed. The killer or detective characters are as frequently women as they are men. The films are filled with sleaze, sex, and nudity, and released during a time when censors were laxing up just enough for directors to challenge what they could get away with on screen. The visual styles are something not typical with the later slashers. The music is also truly one of a kind, sounding anywhere from badass synthy to really out of the place jazz with guitars, slappy basses and piano, or steamy saxophones that would feel more at home in a 1970s porno movie rather than a murder mystery. And buckets of blood are standard. The brighter the color, 
the better. The gore isn't always realistic looking, but it's definitely theatrically presented, whether for good or for bad. Lastly, a giallo can be easily identified usually by the title alone. They may be questions like who saw her die, or commands like strip nude for your killer, or popularly they'll feature an animal, a color, or a number in the title, or some combination of these like a weird Venn diagram, and in the one single instance, all three together, birthing the holy trinity of giallo titles with Dario Argento's 1971 film, Four Flies on Grey Velvet. My personal favorite title is probably The House with the Laughing Windows. And that's basically it. I'm going to wrap up this video now. If you have any issues with my timeline of cinematic events in this video, please know that I could have made this video to be twice as long. So in my defense, if you believe that I forgot something, overlooked something, was outright oblivious to something, or was frankly incorrect about something, that that is not necessarily the case. I just had to pick and choose what I decided to talk about, and in some instances I had to be brief and limit my own explanations. If there's something that you believe would have been more beneficial for me to talk about, be it a movie or genre leading up to giallo cinema, feel free to mention those items in the comments below. I really do appreciate the feedback. Thanks as always for watching my content. You know the YouTube drill. Like and subscribe for more of my content, ring the notification bell to be alerted as soon as new videos and shorts drop, comment any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns, and thanks again. Next big video is the full breakdown of Giallo film cliches list. This is to give you all information about the cliches I will be looking for when I watch Giallo movies, how many points these cliches are worth, and how I will tally up my Giallo tally. Thanks again. Take it easy, boy. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Horrible. Faded, fat, greedy women. But they're alive. They're human beings. Are they? Is he? All I had to do was take them by surprise from behind. <laughs> <laughs>